So that's me. I'm Peter Pogatofer. That's my handle on Twitter. I work here, as already told, more specifically here, and that's the group I'm in. Um, we're in the, in, as you can see, in the new logo here, we don't have a uh, um, valid uh, corporate design at the moment, but we have something temporary up. Um, what I do most of the time is um, I dabble around with design, design theory and design practice. I think about how design should be, or how, try to understand how it works. I try to find out how design fits into um, like programming and software development, and I uh, do interaction design, game design, experience design, and stuff like that. That's most of that occupies most of my time. And as one of designer, as a designer, I approach the following problem, um, and I would love to talk about that for like an hour, but there is no time to do that. <laughs> Um, because I think I can make you understand this sentence, and this is very true. Actual learning is a collateral benefit of going to school or to university. <laughs> Universities no longer, not even try to teach us something. They occupy us, and they hope that in the, um, as a collateral benefit of this occupation, students and pupils learn something. There's a brilliant book, The Game of School, by Robert Fried, who talks extensively about that problem. I would suggest, if you don't believe me, Read that book and you will find out how much true that is. That there's this game going on between teachers and parents and students and everybody wants to believe that it's the right thing we do and everybody's learning very much, especially the students, while everybody knows that this is not true. I, wanna, I think that this goes very much back to that we still have this carrot on a stick approach. The carrot being the, the mark on, the, on your course, the certificate, the degree, whatever you want to have at the end, your diploma, um, and we are holding out this stick in front of students and make them run towards the carrot and we run behind them and tell them what to do on the way while they run. And as long as they do it, we promise them they will get the stick. And at one point we stop and they get, uh, no, they, won't get, uh, they will get the carrot, not the stick. <laughs> they only get the stick if they go into academia. So at one point they get the carrot and um, then we hope that they have learned something. But in reality, there's this, this two uh, words, like you can pass a test or you can learn something. And I think this is actually something that fights against each other. If you want to pass a test, you don't learn anything. And if you learn something, you will not pass. And what we're trying to find is reconciling those two. We have to, because I cannot take university and discard with it and make totally new approaches in different um, um, environments. I work at university, I want to make it better, so I try to reconcile those. I want to see that when students pass in my course that they have learned something. So these are our students. Let me introduce our students. We have lots of them, this is about a, a third or something, so we have 700 students. I think one of the people on, the, on this picture is actually in this auditorium right now. And as you can see, they also have lo loads of computers, so um, probably we can find a way, they're all connected to the internet, to use this new fangled stuff to um, solve these problems. The way we do it is, we're not, on the, we're not educational theorists. We have no idea, we have a little bit basic ideas about like, okay, there's constructivism and there's connectivism and stuff like that. And we understand that but we're not the people who build educational models from that, or educational practice from that. So what we're doing is explorative design. We implement systems, we, let, we use them in our courses, the students use them, we try to find out, does it work better now? Is it become more interesting? We watch the students, what they do with the systems, like the, the threaded path, the cow path in the system, and we pave those paths so they can work them better and try to understand what works and what doesn't work. Five years ago, I was giving traditional lectures and making tests and trying to find out whether it's possible if I really make, I really try to make a good lecture and my evaluations claim that I make relatively good lectures. <laughs> if I make a really good, if I put a lot of effort into making a good lecture, do students learn more? And it turns out, no. There were, I had like five things that I wanted to, students to learn five basic ideas and at the end of the course I found out that a, a lot of them don't even know those five basic things so I thought okay this has to change radically so let's skip three years and then two years ago two years ago we were approximately at this point and this is what is still working when you come into a lecture of me now there's me that's me 
And that's my, the slide I'm presenting. And, well, it's quite traditional. I flip switch to the next slide and talk. But uh, what you will find is that students have an, a system on their computer running. No, it's actually a web page in their browser um, where they can add. Sorry, that's me. But never mind. Um, it should be the, the headshot of the student or whatever. Um, so they can add comments to this slide right now. And whenever I switch the slide, this field changes to the next slide. And they can, so they can type in live comments, notes, or whatever they want, whatever they think is interesting for them in, in um, uh, uh, relation to the slide. And they can tag the slides. They have little buttons here. They can say, I like this slide, or hey, this is important, or I don't get it at all. Just for future reference, they will find the slides <laughs> later on using these little tags they have distributed. And they have can discussions, you know, like there's, there's some, somebody answered to something I posted here. So I can see what everybody else is typing at the moment. We're using, it's a little crowd we have. To, no, we are crowdsourcing, it's a little, or, or a little cloud we have. We have, when you have. When you have like two or three hundred users, you can do pretty amazing stuff by just having a few people doing something. So somebody answered, and suddenly there's this little discussion going on in the middle of the lecture. I'm not part of that. I'm still making my lecture because I cannot read that while giving a lecture. This is all happening in the auditorium. Once the lecture is over, everything gets collected into um, this system that we call a studio. There you have all the slides that I've been using, and I'm posting additional stuff like um, my, my notes and, and sources. And there's everything, so everything I post is, is yellow here. And then there's the stuff all the other students have posted, um, and they're discussing it. So you find my notes, my sources, you find questions, you find answers by other students, probably my answers if I think this is a good question. You find remarks, links, people post a lot of links. That's, that's a nice thing. We found out that people actually post links, more links one or two weeks after the lecture has happened. This is an educator's dream. We find out that people actually think about what I tell them one or two weeks later when they find, find a reference in the real world. They say, hey, something like that has just happened. And they post a link in here. They post objections or events. We have discussions going on. We have platform wars going on. Of course, these informatics students, they always fight platform wars between Linux and Windows and OS X or whatever. <laughs> and when you take a broader look, this is like eight random slides taking, you see some of them have notes, some don't have notes. Then we found that only about 50% of all notes get posted during lecture, and the other 50% get um, posted out of class. This is wonderful, this is what we want. People engage with what I teach outside of class. So this, is, this was pretty amazing. This is two years ago, has been working since. We have tried to make it better and better. And we find things happening like Discussions going on. This is about password security, and I post a question a little bit down here about how how do you choose your passwords and what are your rules for passwords. And there's this discussion going on about 4,000 words, which is an, an article with a, which I could send in somewhere about password security and concepts come up which I couldn't even touch in a, in, in this lecture. So this is in depth, really. This is the lecture just cursory going over it, and this is an in depth discussion. Would people read it? They would learn so much. And we started attaching, so we started attaching discourse um, questions. Hey, do you know anything about that? Do you understand that? Um, uh, do you think this is true? And stuff like that. And then we, so we, we tried to develop a, a pedagogic model or a pedagogic practice that uses what we have here. So one interesting thing we found out is we take slides from the next lecture. From, so, like, in, on a day between the lectures, I take five slides from the next lecture. It takes place in two or three days or four days. Students don't know anything about the context where this is embedded, but I post questions. There's one question with, these, with each of these slides, often together with URL, where they can, for example, this is a video, they can watch the video, and there's a question. They go off discussing it and discuss. They do. Discuss quite a lot. So this were a course with 120 students, a small course, but we had 256 postings by 64 students, which is, I always love this one because it's so, okay, if you're from informatics, you know why this is funny. Um, and, 
But this means that each student has posted four postings. And we told students, with each of these discussions, if you post one really good posting, you're going to get a point. So three are extra, just because it's interesting to discuss with, with your peers. And we were asking ourselves, OK, there's something in it here. We're going to have to find out what it is. And now let's skip another two years, and I'm going to tell you what I think we found out. And this is how the course is now organized, and why we think um, students are learning wonderful. We call it the radical portfolio. Now, after 10 minutes, I'm finally at the title of talk. <laughs> so that's the radical portfolio. What is it? It's an approach where we have no assignments, we have no deadlines, we have no exams or tests, and we have no game of school, like in this book. We don't play that game anymore. We say, OK, if you want to play a game of school, go ahead, little students. We don't play it. So you have to play it among yourselves. So I don't know. It doesn't work that way. So how does it work? We have a catalog. This is the catalog of activities. It's about 20 different activities. At the moment, it's constantly growing. This is everything students can do. They can choose whatever they want from this catalog to do. It's extendable. If anyone has a good idea, tell us. We're going to put it in there, and it's a new activity. They have an online portfolio system where they document what they have done using these activities as a guide and show it to us. We assign points for good work. Students actually have to say, I think this is worth three points. And then we say, oh, well, this is worth three points. I always say, ah, one point at most. Or, ah, that's four points because this is brilliant and you've just been too humble. No activity in here. There's, there's a guide in here that says, OK, this is only worth one point, or this can be between two and four points, and things like that. No single activity is more than 10% of the grade. So people have to do, over the semester, a lot of different activities. There are certain rules, like you can do this only once, you can do this only once a week, or whatever. You have to do this before you do this. So it's a little bit more complicated than... But we don't have deadlines. You can do it whenever you want. So if no activity is more than 10% of the grade, students have to work all the time. We find that in... In average, or at minimum, students who turn out positive have to hand in something like 13 or 14 activities. Most are less than 5% of, of, of an A grade. And there's a hand in limit per week, because we don't want students at the end of the semester to suddenly realize, ooh, I have to do like um, uh, uh, enough um, activities so I can get a grade, and then hand in this huge pile of stinking crap uh, for us to look at, which is a lot of work for us, and there's not a lot of work in, so they will likely fail. So they have, there's this limit, how much they can hand it each week, more or less. So they have to work continually on, on hanging. So that's a couple of the activities. I want to show you a couple of the activities. So that's a number of slides in a different view, and there's a lot of activities hidden in here. So we have an activity here, and one here, and one here. Um, or an exercise, actually. We call it exercise if it's coupled to the slides. And there's something that goes with this slide. And there's something that goes with this slide. There's a specific exercise where you can do something where you might learn something about uh, what this slide was about. So that's one thing. We have between 50 and 100 different exercises in a good course where this works out. Another thing is if you find this symbol on a slide, this one, come on, then... then then you, then, then you, then this is the message to a student that I, in the lecture, cannot really talk about what's going on here. This is like profiling via HTTP referral. This is some Im immensely difficult but very dangerous thing. And um, so, if you're a student and you want to learn something about that and show show that to us, you write a contribution. This is what the symbol is about. You can write a contribution in depth, again vertical. And writing they do. We get loads and loads of contributions, so many that we cannot read them all. So we built a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, um, not peer-to-peer, -peer, um, double-blind peer-reviewing system where other students, which is another activity, can review contributions written by their peers. And once we have three reviews, it's very easy for us to judge whether this is a good contribution and give them the points. And the third, uh, then there's the meta Activity, you see this catalog, you think, wow, that's a great idea, I have an idea for a new activity. You uh, propose it, that's worth two points. And if it's a good activity, we actually put it in there, and the course changes somewhere in the semester because there's a new activity. Remember, you can do that at any time. We don't care when you do which activity, because there's little hierarchy in the things we teach in, in the courses. Okay, so there's the online system. It's really ugly, I'm sorry for that. We're working on it. 
There's one entry for, for one work you did on one activity. There's the points you get. So this student wanted three points and received three points. You can see your colleagues. It's really built like a social software system. We're looking very much what is good at Facebook. So you have your colleagues, which you can, you can show entries to your colleagues and get reviews by them, informal reviews before you hand something in, which is very important. Whoa. <clears throat> and you get comments, feedback from by us, reviews by other people, double IP reviews, and you can make updates. If something is wrong, you only get one point instead of four. You can make an update and hand it in again, and you get the other points if you did. So, and one wonderful thing is we can hand out achievement badges or medals or whatever and say, this is brilliant work. It's probably more, more likely something like this, an Xbox thingy. And you can be proud of that and actually show it off. And then this is embedded in some newsfeed, Facebook style thingy. So I, I'm going to show you only one result. And this is the distribution of grade we're getting with this. This is the distribution of grade. This is the inverse of what we would normally get. We have many ones and twos, not many threes. So we are, we are able to actually make a border between the students who can work autonomously, who can work on their own, and those who can <coughs> instead of having the usual bell curve, which I always didn't understand why this should be true. So this is what we call the radical portfolio. No assignments, no deadlines, no game of school. Instead, an open but still structured and continuous work, lots of small talk, fast feedback, and the chances to learn from your mistakes, because this is where we learn most. Now there's one more thing. So, now what if, what if a whole program, a whole uh, um, study program would use that, that kind of approach with a portfolio, with a radical portfolio, without deadlines and assignments, that we could have this thick catalog of all activities for your university education. You could say, I don't want a degree. I just want to make the interesting things, and I have a different catalog of activities that somebody else who wants to have a degree, who has to take a catalog that is actually pre-assembled for him. And then he, the person would have this online portfolio where everything she does is collected. So when they're finished with their studies, everything they have done in their time is available online for them, or even offline, download, downloadable, I mean, this is, this is an amazing idea for me, but they could take it and make all kinds of online portfolios, like for their parents or for um, applying for a job, which would um, be able to draw from the fascinating things they did during their, during their, their time at the university. And they could even be, take the medals we gave them and say, look, and in this course, I was the best student, and show that off to the employer because we have it's, it's not difficult. We crypto, 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 cryptographically secure them so you can actually show them off and somebody else can see if this is true, what you're saying. And this was the moment when we saw that, when we went, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I wanted to tell you, so thank you. <laughs>